All right, so here we are beginning our Judaism unit. Having just completed our Islam unit, we are not going chronologically here. Just to make, make that clear from the onset here. Um, Judaism is, of course, much older than both Christianity and Islam. Um, we're just following the, uh, the flow of the chapters in the textbook. And Judaism here is chapter 7. It begins by pointing out, it has, it has been estimated that one-third of our Western civilization bears the marks of its Jewish ancestry. <clears throat> now, this is uh, quite a big deal because it's disproportionate. The number of Jews is minuscule. I mean, it's not minuscule, absolutely speaking. It's minuscule in terms of the percentage of the whole. Uh, there's there's several million Jews in the world today. I, I I don't have the exact figure off the top of my head, but there's almost eight billion people in the world. So it's a, a tiny it's a tiny tiny fraction of the world's population. Yet the influence of Judaism is enormous, and I, I won't dispute that this estimate is correct. That a third of our entire civilization can be traced back to Judaism. Um. This is, in, in other classes I teach, we, I go over some historians who refer to two pillars of Western civilization being Jerusalem and Athens. Athens being the intellectual, scientific, philosophical tradition that undergirds so many of our, our ways uh, throughout the history of Western civilization, and Jerusalem, the religious uh, side of things. And then both pillars are actually necessary for our Western civilization. Uh, but anyway, here we're, of course, focusing on the Jerusalem pillar, not the Athenian one. We, uh, we see the influences everywhere. And, of course, a big reason for this is that Judaism is the foundation of what is by far history's biggest religion, namely Christianity. But also on its own right, the influence is enormous. For example, um, many of the teachings in Christianity are directly from Judaism, not just inspired by Judaism or something like that, but directly from them, uh, you know, above all the Ten Commandments. There's absolutely no change in the Ten Commandments for a Christian. It's from Judaism, and it's just as much in Christianity. We'll get to that when we get to it. Uh, I begin here on their discussion sheet. The first question is, what are some of the most significant contributions of Judaism? I know that's a ridiculously broad question, but I just want to put a few scattered things down on your notes to give you a taste of these contributions as our textbook describes them. It first goes over what is not the contribution. What is so special about Judaism? Well, first, let's, you know, what I'm sure you do on my quiz is process of elimination. If you don't know what on earth the answer is, you try to first cross off what it's not. So it's not an enormous empire. We see the influences of enormous empires in, our, in Western civilization, civilization, certainly. The influences of the Roman Empire, for example. Well, that's not where we find Judaism's contribution. Not an enormous empire. Uh, Nothing particularly special about the promised land itself, the, the land that the Jews eventually inhabited after their deliverance from Egypt. So what is it? I don't want to go through all the details of the author talking about what it's not, that it's not a huge empire, that it's not a special place or anything. Because he sums it all up with a profound paragraph here. Our author says, If the key to the achievement of the Jews lies neither in their antiquity nor in the proportions of their land and history... Where does it lie? This is one of the greatest puzzles of history, and a number of answers have been proposed. The lead that we shall follow is this. What lifted the Jews from obscurity to permanent religious greatness was their passion for meaning. Their passion for meaning. So, that's what I want to put down first. their emphasis on meaning. That there is meaning in everything. Why is there meaning in everything? Because God is the architect of history. Because there is a God, first of all. That there is a God, and there's one God, and it's all powerful and all good, that's from Judaism. We have that from Judaism way before uh, the existence of Christianity or Islam. And if we take that for granted, if that's true, then everything that God allows, that everything that happens, happens because God allowed it to happen, or because he specifically did it. Well, it's one of those two options. If he's all-powerful, Anything only happened because God let it happen. So there is meaning to be found in everything. 
This is the radical opposite of what? Nihilism. So Judaism's essential contribution here is that it is the opposite of nihilism. And nihilism, more and more in the modern West, is beginning, beginning to dominate, just rejecting the idea of meaning in anything. No, there's no meaning. It's all just molecules. We see the most severe, perhaps, uh, explication of nihilism in Frederick Nietzsche, who rejects Judaism and Christianity categorically as evil <laughs> uh, because of perhaps precisely this, because they see meaning in things. That meaning is waiting to be discovered. That We don't have the right to foist our own meaning upon things. Whatever a people's philosophy, the book says here, it must take account of the, quote, other. There are two reasons for this. First, no one seriously claims to be self-created. And as they are not, other people, being likewise human, do not bring themselves into being either. From this it follows that humankind has issued from something other than itself. Second, everyone at some point finds his or her power limited. So these are these two issues that we have to take account of in our own philosophy. That we didn't make ourselves, in other words, that we're not God, and that we're very limited. So the ultimate questions, whatever the answers I should say are to the ultimate questions, they find their fulfillment not within us but outside of us. We can't just navel gaze and pretend that we can figure it all out, in other words. The answer comes from outside of us. The answer is given in the very first line of the Hebrew Scriptures. In the beginning, God. And that's the first line also of this section in the textbook. In the beginning, God. That meaning is found in God. This explanation of the other, this, this, this other, that every, everyone's personal philosophy must at some point address. This idea of the other is neither I want to give a few things that their idea of the other is not. And I could just say God. But, you know, we're talking thousands of years B.C. here where there wasn't a notion specifically of a monotheistic God that pervaded most cultures. So there, was, there was this idea of the other, you know, God's spirits, mysterious forces, cosmogenic myths, and so forth. But um, whatever we're considering as the other, the transcendent, the beyond, this other, in the view of Judaism, is not chaotic, amoral, or hostile. We take this for granted today, but we do not see this in history in the time of the ancient Jews. The other, in all of those ancient myths, is a very foreign notion to the idea of the other that we tend to have today. It's chaotic. There is not an order. There is not a structure. There is not reliability. There is not... There is not... Um, design so much. Things don't always make sense. They don't fit together. They're, they're amoral is what comes next. In other words, what's right and wrong is not clearly, um, I should say, what is good is not clearly advocated for by the other. Sometimes the other is not good. Ever read uh, uh, the ancient mythology and ancient Greek mythology or any, any other culture's ancient mythology? The gods are not always good. There's an existential crisis here because... God must be good. Our heart seems to tell us that. And we find that first in Judaism. And it's certainly not hostile. Sometimes the gods are downright, not just indifferent to good, good and evil, but downright evil. They're like they are anti-people. They want to destroy us in some cases. We can only appease them maybe by human sacrifice or something, which also Judaism is first in having none of. No, no human sacrifice in Judaism. Um, so this, I, this, is, this is, you probably wondering why I'm excited about this because this is so obvious to you if you're just an average Westerner. You, you, per, um, you take these things for granted that there is, you know, and, you know, I know it's changing by the day, but still, statistically speaking, odds are you believe in God and that you believe that God's good and uh, that he's pro-human. <laughs> he's not against us. Those are groundbreaking notions that, you know, 4,000 years ago when Judaism kind of came to be formally with Abraham. Uh, and yet, 
these are uh, very these become over the course of Judaism's growth very clear teachings within Judaism that God is orderly that he is good and that he loves us these are earth-shattering groundbreaking notions that we have thanks to Judaism okay what specifically is this other that it is a and you actually know what I'm sorry I missed something pretty important here that is that God is not that the other is not not prosaic brute dead matter you might think that strict materialism is this brand is this postmodern invent idea unfortunately it's not it's uh it's there are plenty of materialist ancients as well and that uh whatever the other is is purely material there is no personal other the book says here um the the uh this this um well you know let me not get all into that the uh it's still significant that they are not at all going for that. It wasn't, I mean, I don't want to imply that it was at all as common back then as it is today, this materialism, but you can find it in, in, in some of the writings of the ancients. I think some of the ancient Greeks, they wanted to chalk up everything to these material processes. And uh, Judaism certainly is radically at odds with that. And this is even pre-Christian, I'm talking uh, times here. So anyway, but let's, let's move on here to talk about what it, what it is what the other is as a primary contribution of, uh, of Judaism here. That whatever this other is, it's supreme it is single, it is a will. It has its desires for us. It is not indifferent, in other words. It's absolutely one, of course, monotheism. It is absolutely supreme, all-powerful. Nothing can, nothing can resist it. Nothing can resist this other. Now, of course, we know we're talking about God here. We're using this broad term, other, just because this mysterious idea of something else, something out there, hadn't yet even been fully consolidated into the monotheistic picture yet. This is, this is the newness of Judaism. So this other as a single supreme will. We have a will, but so does this other, whatever it is. It, it is a will, a supreme will. Okay. The book here says, it is easy to smile at the anthropomorphism of the early Hebrews. In other words, oh, they just fashioned God in our image. Well, look, Let's take for granted for a moment, let's just, for the sake of argument, let's suppose for a moment that, that man is made in the image of God. If man is made in the image of God, then, you, then a materialist can just as easily argue, no, man just fashioned God in his own image. Merely stating that is not an argument. It's just saying that you are opposed to the view. It's, iron, it's ironic that some phrase that as an argument today. Um, but no, it's, it is, in the final analysis, the book says, ultimate reality is much more like a person than it is like a thing, more like a mind than it is like a machine. So the, the greatest substance is not gold or diamond or anything like that. The greatest substance is a person. Uh, reality is more like a person than it is like a dead, brute substance of matter. It's at its deepest level. It seems to be more like this idea of a single supreme will. This is not that the Jews deified matter. They were not pantheists. They didn't believe that everything was God. Far from it. They believed that God permeated all things. That he was, in other words, omnipresent. Omniscient, omnipresent, all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere. Uh, that he was completely in charge of everything. There was nothing to fear, ultimately, because God is in charge. And not only is he in charge, but he is good. These things that, again, you might take for granted today, but which were groundbreaking in their day, and we have thanks to Judaism. This other as beautiful, moral, interested, and loving. This 
interested. There's an interesting contribution there to the list. That not only is God good, but that we matter enough that he cares about us. So it's one thing to say that there's a single God, that he's all good and all powerful. But then you might still see it argued, oh, well, man, we're, we must be just like fleas compared to him. So he must just, sure, he's good and all powerful, but he must not care much about us. Well, actually, he does, Judaism says. And that, again, might be something that you might take for granted, but that is groundbreaking in its day. We have to kind of make the gods care about us in, in, in much ancient thought by doing enough human sacrifice, maybe, or some other brutal thing like that. Uh, no, God is, by default, deeply interested in us. In fact, that's his passion, is us. He cares uh, more about us than you could possibly say. Thank you, Judaism, for that as well. Okay, moving along here. So where, their, where the Jews differed from their neighbors was not in envisioning the other as personal necessarily, but in focusing the other's personalism in a single, supreme, transcending will. I didn't put that on the board here, but the transcending is an important aspect of the Jewish contribution here. You can see plenty of ancient thought with this, I, with, with, that presents the other as personal, but maybe in an animistic sense, where everything is a spirit. You know, there's that tree spirit out there, and I can go talk to it. Uh, but no. Uh, with the Jewish thought, this supreme will is transcendent. It's everywhere, but not because these things are literally it, but just because you can't escape from the supreme will. Uh, it's transcendent. In and of itself, it is beyond everything. It's everywhere, but it's beyond everything. So this is not pantheism. That's very important to understand. Pantheism says everything is God. God is everything. Monotheism says God is everywhere, but substantially he is separate because creation issued forth from him. Creation is not him. So creation reveals God's qualities. A perfect craftsman always creates something that reflects the perfect idea of it that he has in his mind. An imperfect craftsman, you might look at his craft and it might have all sorts of problems in it that do not derive that are, aren't that weren't part of his plan. But the perfect craftsman, which of course no human is a perfect craftsman, but if there were a perfect craftsman, you could look at anything he created and you would know that it is exactly what he had in mind. It's exactly what he wanted to create. But if God is a perfect craftsman, and as Judaism indeed says he is, then you could look at anything he created as it was intended to be, and in that created thing, he's revealing something about himself because he's a perfect craftsman. So human nature, the, the Jew, consequently, the Jews had a very high regard for the human body, the human person, human nature. What is visible reveals truths about God that are invisible. Now, this, this doesn't mean that everything is exactly as God wills it because Judaism is very clear there was a fall. Originally, everything was exactly as God wills it. Uh, but then there was a fall from grace, and there was original sin, and things became distorted and subject to sin and suffering and death and degeneration. But the primacy in things, the primacy in created things, is still found in their natural integrity, in, in their revealing things about God. So you look at uh, we all know that there is imperfection and deformation in the world, but if you actually think about it, you can also separate the deformation from the integral nature of the thing in question. And when you look at the integral nature of the thing in question, that is what you want to consider in theologizing or philosophizing about what it tells you about God. Uh, and, you know, just I can look at this window here and do it easily. There are... Uh, there are plenty of imperfect things, and most of the imperfect things you see out here are thanks to me being a slob and not you know, properly cleaning up the branches that I had to cut down and stuff. But, you know, there's a, even plants can get cancers and diseases and stuff, and, and, you know, animals as well. But you can also kind of look past those things, and you can see what the things are as God intended them to be. And how things are as God intends them to be reveals things about God himself and about our own calling. This is... Uh, this idea we can also trace back to Judaism. So it's not polytheism, it's not pantheism, but it does in, in, in fact insist that creation reveals things about God. 
And I'm getting a, I'm sorry, I didn't line up the questions perfectly in this discussion sheet. I asked you a couple questions down. How does Judaism view creation slash nature slash matter? I'll give you some more on that later. But for now, let's just have down that creation reveals God's qualities. but is not God himself. And again, that's for the third question down. How does Judaism view creation slash nature slash matter? I'll give you more on that later. But there's just one note you can have down for the time being. All right. What is Judaism's response to existential despair? Let me get to that in a moment. A few of the things I have highlighted in the book here that I wanted to touch on. The God of the Jews possessed none of the traits that Lucretius in, uh, around, uh, in Rome rebelled against. So there's this, this atheist, Lucretius, a skeptic, he, he um, rightly rebelled against all the absurdity in Greek mythology. I mean, if you've learned anything about Greek mythology in, in high school, you probably are, are very thankful that you're not an ancient Greek, well, I assume you're not uh, a, a Greek polytheist. I don't think that there are many of those left today. Um, because they're immoral, the Greek gods are immoral, they're vindictive, they're capricious. Uh, this skeptic this ancient skeptic rejected this as absurd and, and a jew would actually agree yes he would a jew would say yes that is absurd because the god of the jews possesses none of those traits the supreme achievement of jewish thought is not so much its monotheism as such meaning just the idea that there's one god but rather in the character that it ascribed to god you know, we've, and we've gone over these these traits that what god said what jews said about the one god the God of Sinai, the, the God of the Jews, as uh, the God as Jews understood him, watched over widows and orphans, seeks out the lonely, the heart sick, and his loving kindness is from everlasting to everlasting, and whose tender mercies are in all of his works. Those are all paraphrases from uh, Jewish texts. Such then was the Hebrews' conception of the other that confronts the human being. Not prosaic, for at its center sits enthroned a being of awesome majesty. Not chaotic, for it coheres in a divine unity. The reversal of amoral or indifferent, it centers in a God of righteousness and love. Are we surprised, then, to find the Jew exclaiming with exultation a frontier discovery, Who is like you among the gods, O Yahweh? What great nation has a God like the Lord? And those are direct quotes from Hebrew texts there. It's this surprise, and then the, the book is very accurate in acknowledging that, our author here. It's like a frontier discovery. It's like a scientist discovering a new uh, element or something. These, the Jews learning about God revealed in the Jewish texts because he's so different from what had been known thus far uh, in the religions of the ancient world. Caring about the widow and the orphan, being merciful and compassionate, forgiving and loving and good. This is... Uh, earth-shattering, groundbreaking, as I said. All right. Everyone at times, this is a quote from your book here, everyone at times finds himself asking whether life is worthwhile, which amounts to asking whether, when the going gets rough, it makes sense to continue to live. Those who conclude that it does not make sense give up if not once and for all by suicide, then piecemeal, meaning bit by bit, by surrendering daily to the encroaching desolation of the years. Whatever else the word God may mean, it means a being in whom power and value converge, a being whose will cannot be thwarted, and whose will is good. In this sense, to affirm that existence is God created is to affirm its unimpeachable worth. So everybody, the book is saying here, eventually comes to a point where they ask, is life worth living? 
And, you know, most people don't get to the point of committing suicide, supposing that it doesn't, but everyone's tempted to consider that question at some point. Uh, that is the, the temptation of existential despair. Is this even worth bothering with, this thing we happen to call life? Judaism has a response to that. And uh, the, uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is a, an, an absolute yes. But there's a reason why the answer is yes. Because there is a God whose will cannot be thwarted and whose will is always good. Even if the details as it plays out are not always exactly fun and nice and low in pain. So, however desperate things become, there is always a meaning. However desperate things become, there is always a meaning. Put in a quick little phrase that you may have heard before, no matter what, God has a plan. There's a reason for what you're going through. There's a reason for what the world is going through. And there are no exceptions to that fact. This is what Judaism says. You never have to wonder, man, so I know God is, I know God is good in general. What about now? You know, what about what I'm going through now? What about what the world's going through now? Maybe, maybe that rule has been suspended for a bit. Uh, the answer is no. That rule has not been suspended, and that rule never will be suspended. There is always a meaning. God always has a plan. No exceptions. Uh, that's certainly Judaism's teaching and, ju and a contribution of Judaism. But the interesting thing is that this is also a philosophical conclusion you can come to. If... Uh, I go over this in my intro philosophy classes in the Middle Ages philosophy unit, that the, the Middle Ages philosophers did a great job proving, not at all using religious texts, they were purely philosophizing here, saying, an all-good, all-powerful God exists. If, sorry, if an all-powerful, all-good God exists, and they did believe that there was an all-good, all-powerful God, how is there evil in the world? You know, the problem of evil, you've probably heard it before. Um, in, in philosophizing about the problem of evil, they pointed out, yeah, they were honest. They were very honest with the, the criticisms of their views. They said, yeah, it doesn't seem to make sense that if there's an all-good, all-powerful God, that there could be evil and suffering in the world. So they, they said, they, in, in philosophizing about that, they concluded that every single solitary pain, suffering, evil of any sort must First of all, not be from God, because God uh, would never will evil specifically. But that's not a good enough answer, because then uh, the the um, the critic could just say, well, why, if he's all good and all powerful, why doesn't he get rid of it then? So they continued to philosophize. They didn't go with a quick, easy answer that just, oh, God didn't make evil. He said, for God so much as to allow an evil to occur, he must know with absolute certainty that three conditions are met. I mean, sorry, three conditions must be, must be met. One, he must know with absolute certainty that he will bring a good out of it. Two, the good that he will bring out of it must be greater than the evil he's permitting to happen. But he never directly does evil. He's just permitting it. And three, there must be no other possible way. Because even an all-powerful God cannot bring about an effect intrinsically linked to a given cause without that cause. That's just nonsense. That's like a rock being too big for an omnipotent, an omnipotent God to lift. That just doesn't make sense. Like square circle. Um, and that's an incredibly, that's probably the single most consoling philosophical teaching that I've ever come across. Because it tells you, without deferring to any sort of holy text, that every single unfortunate thing that happens is guaranteed to, in time, bring about a greater good. And all we have to do is, with the Jews, trust that however desperate things become, there's always a meaning. There's always a plan. There's always, always, always a plan. Sometimes it takes patience to wait for it to come about, yes, but there's always a plan. And we thank Judaism for its response to existential despair there. Um, when, things go, when things do go wrong, 
It's not because God himself did that. It's because we human beings messed things up with our free will. That, uh, that God could have created a universe of just robots that just automatically always do what he wants. But he wanted to, and, and you know, plants and animals always, they, they, ne they never sin. So God already has a bunch of those in creation. But he also, he wants to fill every nook and cranny of creation with beings of different kinds. We are the only beings in the whole face of the planet who have a free will, who can choose freely to serve God or rebel against him. And that freedom is such a great gift that creation would be lacking if there were not beings that had that gift. And those beings just happen to be us. So when things do go wrong, it's because we chose to make them go wrong. But even that, even that, God only allows when he knows he's going to bring a good out of it. That's incredibly deep, incredibly profound. And that, I, that sense permeates Jew, uh, Jewish thought from of old. I'm not even, I don't think I'm even going to try to put all that into even shorter uh, words for your notes. Because honestly, you'll be fine as long as you have this there. There's always a meaning. Sometimes it takes time, but it's always there. Sometimes it takes time to realize and to come to, a, to, to know, but it's always there. How does Judaism view creation, nature, matter? So I gave you one thing for that already. I'll give you some more things in the upcoming minutes here. Actually, be, but be, before we move on from this completely, there's another a great quote here on uh, this existential despair. He says, Some have proposed that the best way, the best educational toy we could give children is a jigsaw puzzle in which the pieces do not fit together in which none of the pieces fit together. How horrible is that? Why would anyone propose that the best way we could teach children about reality, about the world they've been born into, is to give them jigsaw puzzles with pieces that don't fit together? First of all, that would be horrendous. I would never do that. Uh, but if we did that with, with our children over time, what would that teach them? it would eventually break down their, their God-given instinct that there is a meaning. Because we all do have that instinct, by the way. Um, we all instinctually know, intuitively, that there is a meaning in things, that there is a plan. Uh, we just forget that in our darker moments, perhaps. But anyway, uh, if we just kept giving children these kinds of puzzles, it would eventually break down that instinct, and they would start to just give up on ever finding a plan, finding a meaning, finding a purpose in, in suffering and, and in difficulty and challenge. And they would become nihilists, eventually. They would become existential nihilists. Now, the Jew says reality is like a jigsaw puzzle given to us by God. Not because it's primarily to be figured out by the intellect. Yes, that's important, but that's not our primary duty. Our primary duty is to live it well. Um, you know, a, a simple person can be a much better person and usually is a much better person than a scholar. But I digress. Um, th the point is, there is a meaning because the Jewish outlook says, be like, um, well, be like my kids. So my kids love jigsaw puzzles. And they love them. Uh, even if they're very challenging, they'll just keep working at it. It doesn't matter how long it takes. They'll keep working at it until they finish the puzzle because they know they made a kind of existential act of trust in me, I suppose, knowing that I will not give them a puzzle with pieces that don't fit together. I wouldn't do that. They know I wouldn't do that. Even though they're just even even the ones even the my kids who are just toddlers know that, um, that's the outlook that the Jew takes on God. That God's not going to give us a jigsaw puzzle with pieces that don't fit together. Might take a while for them to fit together. Might take we we might not even see all the pieces come together in our life, and that's okay. We will ultimately see them all come together because they do fit together. Um, there is that meaning. The Jewish affirmation, here's a direct quote from the book here. The Jewish affirmation that the world is God created equipped them with a constructive premise. However desperate their lot, however deep the valley of the shadow of death they found themselves in, they never despaired of life itself. Meaning was always waiting to be won. The opportunity to respond creatively was never absent. For the world had been fashioned by the God who not only meted out the heavens with a span, but whose goodness endured forever. 
uh, if something's going to be forever, that means it's never going to change. So the Jewish outlook is very clear. God's goodness will never change, ever. Man changes. God does not change. God is always good. If he's good yesterday, he's good today, and he's good tomorrow. Uh, so they always trust in that, no matter how dark things got. And if you read the history of the Jews, you know that things got very dark for them. But they never lost this trust. They wandered, they strayed, they sinned even, but they never lost that trust. All right, so this presupposition, they didn't philosophize about this. They weren't philosophers primarily. They did some philosophizing maybe. They were primarily, they were existentialists. They took these things for granted. These were their existential givens. These were their presuppositions. These were their premises. There is a God. He is good. He has a will. He created the world. He governs the world with justice. Uh, he will, in the end, be victorious. These presuppositions led them to conclude that matter was good because he made it, and he is good. So now we're back to that question there. Matter is good. They weren't Manichaeans, in other words. They weren't... You know, there are many ancient views where kind of the strict dualism where there's spirit and there's matter. And they certainly believed in spirit and matter. They believed that, you know, we had souls and their souls are spiritual and the spiritual is higher than the material. But they didn't believe that the material was evil and that it was against the spiritual. They believed that both the material and the spiritual were created by God and both good. Um, so th there's, there were many ideas where the, where the two were in constant contrast, in constant opposition. And, um, and some, ironically, took this in a direction where, hey, you can do whatever you want with your body. It's just a piece of matter. You can, you can go and be dissolute and, and participate in these orgies, these horrendous acts. Uh, absolutely not. So it's ironic that some supposing that the spirit is so supreme just means that the body doesn't matter, which also means you can do whatever with it, which is just self-defeating. You start doing whatever you want with the body, you're going to destroy the soul by through what you do with the body. Um, but anyway, the body is good, matter is good, and we can conclude that because it is created by the God who is good. few more details I want you to have down about that. It says here, we find an appreciation of nature blended with confidence in human powers to work with it for the good. And that in its time was exceptional. It was, as we well know, an attitude that was destined to bear fruit. It is no accident that modern science first emerged in the Western world. This is an interesting kind of side, side note. Because matter is good, because it's not anti-spirit, because it's made by God, it's like, as I said in the previous discussion, it's like a book waiting to be read. Uh, so we have God's specific revelation in the Bible and in the Torah, as a Jew would say, and we have his implicit revelation in creation that's waiting to be studied. And, just, and, and it's, wait, it's got all these secrets locked up in it waiting to be uh, found out by science, which is studying something that is good and true and beautiful. Uh, but that's, you don't need to have all that down. What we can have down here is that matter is good, hence material aspects of life are important. The material aspects of life are important. In other words, you can't just be some disinterested monk out there contemplating and not care about people, uh, people and their lives, the material, even their, you know, the material aspects of their lives, whether they have food and shelter and clothing, that matters. You have an obligation to help people with that. Strong humanitarian emphasis in, in the Judaism and Jewish-inspired religions. You see that a lot more than in Eastern religions. We've got to be completely honest about that. You see much more emphasis in works of mercy, humanitarian aid, in Judaism, Christianity, then, for example, Hinduism or Buddhism. Two, matter can participate in the condition of salvation itself. Okay, we've got three things here. So one was what we just said. Two, matter can participate in the condition of salvation itself.
I'll just have down matter can participate in salvation. You might be wondering what that means. Well, it means very specifically the resurrection of the body. This, a lot of people think that was a new idea in Christianity. It was not. Many ancient Jews, probably most ancient Jews, believed in it. That the body, that if they of course believed in an afterlife, that's another thing that some people try to obfuscate. And yes, the Jew, ancient Jews did believe in heaven and hell. That was, that was not new in Christianity. Um, not only did they believe in an afterlife, but they believe that this afterlife, our bodies will be raised up. That we have a body and a soul, yes, and when we die, our soul leaves the body, but that's only temporary. That on Judgment Day, our bodies and our souls will be reunited. Our bodies will be glorified if, if we go to heaven, and uh, they will be reunited. So they will actually part, our physical bodies will participate in the spiritual salvation because matter is good and willed by God. It's not, he didn't just make it for it to be eternally discarded. He made it to be glorified and, and assumed into himself. So this is amazing. This is also groundbreaking. Uh, this is not something we see so clearly at all in ancient religion. This is just thanks to Judaism. This doesn't mean that the body is as important as the soul. This doesn't mean you can become a saint, a Jewish saint, by going to the gym a lot. Yes, the body is important, but, but it's primarily important because it's the temple of the Spirit. Uh, it's important in and of itself, yes, but even more so because it's the temple of the Spirit. But it is good. Finally, three, nature can host the divine kingdom, or the divine in general, let's just say. Nature can host the divine. So we already said that this is not pantheistic. Nature is not literally itself the divine, but it's also not uh, like completely Buddhist in the sense that this is all just nothing. This is all just garbage. This is uh, what we're ultimately after. This whole material world is kind of irrelevant to. Absolutely not. Judaism does not say that. The material world that we were born into, that God created us in, can host God himself. Now, as I say that, hopefully your ears are perking up and you're thinking about a certain something. And that is indeed what Jews are waiting for to this day, God himself. I mean, not as clearly as Jesus said in, in his own ministry, but uh, a, a Christian, of course, looks at this teaching and says, yeah, nature quite literally can host the divine. God himself can enter into it, which he did 2,000 years ago. It's Christian faith. Um, but even aside from Christian faith, there's still the general notion that the kingdom of God is coming. Jews are, are, are waiting for it. They don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, of course, but uh, they still hold the general belief that this can come and will come. Okay, finally, the last thing we have here on this first discussion sheet, how does Judaism view the human person? I'm going to do some erasing. So just pause this and write down if you haven't gotten this done yet. So, where does man himself uh, sit in the relation between God and matter and angels and afterlife and all this stuff? Is man significant or is he insignificant? Well, it's uh, paradoxical, kind of. The one charge that has never been leveled against the Bible is that its characters are not real people. Even its greatest heroes, like David, are presented so unvarnished, so warts and all, that the book of Samuel, which is about King David largely, has been called the most honest historical writing of the ancient world. I'll, I'll get to the question I alluded to in a moment. but um, the, uh, You don't necessarily see this in ancient texts. You know, you, you research these ancient legendary figures, and it's always hard to... It's, it's often very difficult to separate fact from fiction because there's so much embellishment in the writings of those who wrote about the great figures of, like, the Trojan War, which did happen, by the way. They, there's a long period of time where scholars said, oh, that's just a figment of ancient Greek thoughts, imagination, that's just myth. No, it, it did happen. Um, the, uh, but anyway, that doesn't, I'm not saying all the details of the Iliad and the Odyssey are, are true. No, of course not. But that's the problem. 
there's so much embellishment, so much imagination inserted in that you don't know what you're at. You don't know if you're reading about a, the actual qualities of a person who really lived. You you are with the with the Hebrew Bible though. It is not afraid to share all the nitty gritty stuff that an embellishing author would never write about. Uh, you you read about what King David did, you're gonna hate him for. A, I mean, don't please don't. But you're gonna be tempted to really hate this guy. He did horrible things, but he was truly sorry. He repented, and that's a story for us all that we can all be forgiven. Um, so you you don't have to you don't have to have this worry that you're you're reading this embellished tale about uh, some guy who existed, but he was turned into a it was turned into a myth by the text that we're reading. No, you're reading. Uh, you're reading warts and all, as our textbook here says. Uh, yet no realism, the next thing the book says, the, no amount of realism could dampen the aspiration of the Jews. So they were realistic, but this did not cease to make them aspiring. Their realism did not dampen their idealism, you could perhaps say. They were both. Human beings who, on occasion, justly deserve the condemnation maggot and worm. That's from the Hebrew scripture, Job. Chapter 25, verse 6. These maggots and worms, so-called, are equally, are also, beings whom God has, quote, crowned with glory and honor. That's Psalm 8, 6. There is a rabbinic, an, a Jewish saying, to the effect that whenever a man or a woman walks down the street, he or she is preceded, preceded, by an invisible choir of angels crying, make way, make way, make way for the image of God. How on earth do we reconcile these two views of the human person in Judaism? That sometimes we deserve to be called maggot and worm. Who is man that thou art mindful of him, as the Psalms also say. And yet on other occasions, we are so exalted that an angel himself bows before us because we bear the image of God in a way that maybe even an angel doesn't. How on earth does this make sense? Well, it's because of what we can do with our free will. In and of itself, our human nature is so exalted because it's made in the image of God. But the more powerful, the greater a thing is, this is a philosophical axiom, actually. You don't need to, any religion to, to understand this. Uh, the corruption of the greatest is the worst. The greater something is, in its essence, in its nature, the more horrendous its corruption, in other words. Uh, think about it technologically. The more powerful a tool, the more powerful a tool is for good, the more it can be used for evil also. Think about nuclear power. Well, the same tool, the same fundamental tool, can also be used to destroy a city of innocent people in a bomb. Um, human nature is like that. We are beings made in the image of God, Judaism says, with a free will, and as such we are so unbelievably exalted. And yet, through sin, we can also make ourselves lower than a maggot. Because a maggot is not a very pretty thing to think of, but it, it can't contradict God's will. So at least it's always at least it's always safe in that way. But we're not. Because we can choose to rebel against God with our free will. So this is the paradoxical realism of the Jewish view. Uh, let me try and put that in a couple words for your notes. Man, depending on his free will, can be lower than the beasts or higher than the angels. Higher than the beasts or lower than the angels. The problem is we're not only frail, we are weak also. We're exalted and yet we're weak. But we're not only weak, we're sinners. That when we sin, we're doing something much worse than just missing the mark. You know, people say that all the time. Oh, the etymology of the word sin is just missing the mark. Okay, well and good. Looking at the etymology of the thing can be helpful, but it's not uh, exhaustive. Uh, 
rebelling against God is doing a lot more than just messing up a little bit. It's a lot more than just kind of not getting a bullseye when you uh, shoot an arrow at a target. It's contradicting the only reason you exist. Because you don't have to exist. You know, there was a time you didn't exist, and the universe was fine without you. And yet you were called into existence. You didn't make yourself. And uh, I don't need to give you a lesson on the birds and the bees right now, but I can tell you for sure that your parents didn't make you either. <laughs> they were involved, but they didn't make you. Uh, as a parent myself, I can assure you that I did not create my children. The, so something made you, and that something is called God. And he had a reason for making you, uh, to love him, to serve him, to know him, to be happy with him forever. And when, when we choose to contradict these things that are involved, that are required in that process of knowing and loving and serving God, we contradict the only purpose of our existence. It's like we're killing ourselves with each uh, sin we commit. And that, I'm just trying to explain now how, a, how the Jewish view could have so much hinge upon how we use our free will. Because this, too, is, is explosively new in the ancient world. It kind of didn't matter hugely what you did in ancient religious thought in many cases. I'm not saying this was always the case. Because, you know, the gods would kind of do with you whatever. You were maybe important, maybe not, probably not. So if you were bad, oh, well, you're not much of a big deal anyway. If you're good, so what? You're not much of a big deal anyway. But just the universal enormity and immensity of what hinges upon how we choose to live in ancient uh, Jewish thought here is what undergirds this this teaching on human nature. Okay. Meant to be noble, and by the way, I brought up that missed the mark thing because it's in your textbook as well. But uh, I wanted to focus on how saying that sin is just missing the mark uh, kind of misses the mark. <laughs> Meant to be noble, people are often something less. Meant to be generous, we withhold from others. Created more than animal, we often sink to being nothing but. We often we are created to be infinitely higher than the beasts, and yet so often we lower ourselves to even lower than their level. Yet never in these missteps is the misstep required. Free will. Free will means it's free. It means we don't we're never we can never blame God for our sins. We can never blame circumstances for our sins. We can never blame anyone but ourselves for our sins, because we chose to. The Jews, I'm quoting here from the book, the Jews have never questioned human freedom. The first recorded human act involved a free choice. Eating Eden's forbidden fruit. So this is the same in, in Judaism and Christianity, very similar in Islam. Man was, was created in a state of perfection with nature and with himself, with, and he was given a test, a simple test. It, was so, it would have been so easy. Here's all these delicious fruits. There's just one tree I don't want you to eat from. And you might say, well, why did God put that tree there? Why did he have to? Because it was a test. Everyone must be tested. And uh, Adam was tested and he failed. And we inherit the consequences of that failure. But there's a plan in that as well. Remember what we talked about earlier. And God only even allows any evil to occur if he knows he's going to bring about something even greater. And that's, uh, that's certainly the case with, with these most consequential failings and, and, and evils that he allows. But anyway, I digress. Um, this first recorded human act was this choice. In eating Eden's forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve were, it is true, seduced by the snake. But they could have resisted. The snake tempted them. This is a story of human lapse. Inanimate objects cannot be other than what they are. They do what nature and circumstances decree. Human beings, once created, make or break themselves forging their own destinies through their decisions. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. That's Isaiah chapter 1, 16 and 17. That's a Jewish scripture there. Only for human beings does this injunction hold. You can't tell that to an animal. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. You can tell that to your dog, but it's not going to be meaningful. I have set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. These are injunctions that presuppose that we have the freedom to do one way or the other. This is not fatalism. 
This is not uh, materialism. This is not determinism. Where, oh, you know, there's something we're going to do and that's all there is to it. No. We are const- God is begging us in the Jewish scriptures to choose wisely because we have that free choice. We have that free will. And everything hinges upon it. This was a huge theme also in Islam, if you recall from our previous discussions, our previous lecture. Everything hinges upon how we choose to use our free will. And how we choose to use it can never be blamed on anything but ourselves. Because it is, in its essence, free. It cannot be forced. Uh, there's, <laughs> it's, it's a, a lofty. Asp- it's. I know it's. It's putting us in the hot spot, so to speak. It is uh, making great demands upon us, but that's okay. That's the greatness we're meant for. Judaism says. The book also speaks about meaning in history, and that's not something that um, I ask you to have down in your notes, but I do just want to quickly run through a couple of things here. History itself is, is not an arbitrary process in Judaism. There is this hope embedded in the Jewish outlook on history in general, that, it is, that God is working through it towards his ultimate plan. It is not something we have to worry about about uh, ultimately not going according to how he wants it. He's going to win in history as well. It goes through meaning in so many other realms. And, you know, I, I'm not going to go through all the details of that, and you don't need it for your notes either. But the, the book, your textbook, does a great job going through all of these different, uh, all of these different aspects of meaning in the Jewish contribution to thought. Meaning in history is a particularly important um, thing to emphasize and perhaps a good one to stop this lecture video on because there's something called the scandal of particularity. And this has scandalized philosophers, this idea that ultimate meaning itself, absolute reality, truth, and goodness itself could be something historically uh, circumscribed, something actually specific within history. And that's exactly Christianity's claim, of course, that truth itself, goodness itself, is a person, Jesus Christ. Uh, That doesn't make sense to a materialist philosopher who just wants, or a Platonist even, who just wants these abstract ideas to be the ultimate principles. But no, Judaism is waiting for the answer to everything to inject himself into human history. Christians happen to be Jews who believe that that happened 2,000 years ago. Jews are Jews that don't believe that it's happened yet and are still waiting for it. But, um, but there's this agreement that the, scandal of particular, the so-called scandal of particularity is not a valid scandal. That is nothing to be scandalized about. This idea that absolute reality, goodness, and truth itself can and will inject itself into human history in a specific time and place, and that's okay. Uh, God is certainly at liberty to do so. And why not? Why not uh, blast through all of our ideological defenses and become very uh, become incarnate in a literal, specific time and place so that no one can uh, have any more doubts? What's wrong with that in principle? Nothing. Well, you can, all you can do is have a prejudice against that in principle. Uh, you can't really justify having a problem with that. So that's what Judaism is waiting for. That's what uh, Christianity cl- claims is exactly what happened 2,000 years ago. That truth himself, goodness himself, entered human history. So we will move on to our uh, Christianity unit next. There is another uh, discussion, however, we need to have in the Judaism unit still on the Ten Commandments. I don't know if you've already watched that video or if you'll watch it next. So uh, you can look forward to that now or you can look forward to the Christianity unit now, whichever one. So I'm going to stop this recording now. And I'll see you in the next video.